there and welcome to the Secrets of Organ Playing podcast. I'm your host, Vidas Pinkavichus. Today's guest is Frederick Maulo, a contemporary composer, concert organist and pianist from Denmark. As a soloist in concertos with orchestra, Frederick Maulo has played with many important European orchestras and has been invited to play at royal occasions and concerts several times by the Danish royal family. He is the only organist to have reached the international finals in the history of the Eurovision Young Musicians Competition. He did so in 1994 at the age of 16 performing Francis Poulenc's organ concerto to an audience of more than 100 million television viewers worldwide. Frederick Maulo has been also involved in the construction of a new pipe organ and has created the stop list and tonal design for a new organ in Jorlunde Church in Denmark. In this conversation, Frederick shares his insights about bringing the organ alive. Let's go to the show. So, Frederick, I'm so delighted to have this finally this conversation. I've been following you online for a long time and uh, ha- have been aware of your f- uh, fantastic f- f- music forums that you invented basically before anything else, right? Before there were uh, there were any blogs, you were the first, right? Uh, that's, that's that's true. It's been uh, I've been running a pipe organ forum for. 14 years now. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So thank you so much for your time and your future I- insights and welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. So let me ask you the first opening question that I always ask organists in, on this show. Um, uh, how did you fell in love with the organ for the first time? Do you remember this story? I actually know exactly when I fell in love with the organ. Mm-hmm. Uh, My father was an organist, uh, and of course I heard organ music and and came with him to church from since I was a very small child. But initially, I was, the organ was not my main interest, it was the piano, and that's where I started. And in fact, uh, it was not really until when I was about, I think, nine or ten years old, uh, that my father invited me to, to I, I was act, at, at that time I composed uh, pieces for the piano and my father asked me, how would you think about making a, a, a piece for the organ? And I said, oh, well, maybe. And he said, I think you should come and instead of just coming with me, you should have just come and go to the church and, um, and then uh, be there, and so he, I came with him to the church one, and he just left me at the organ for I think for t- two hours or something like that, and I I could just play and learn by myself. I, I, of course, he just started by showing me the very basics. I have seen some of it before. I've never really played the organ myself mm-hmm. until then, and then I just sat there for two hours, and I just completely fell in love with this instrument. Mm-hmm. I was amazed. I was blown away because suddenly when there was no, when I just had time and, and could just play like a, like a, like the little child I was with the instrument, it became like setting me loose in a toy store. Uh, and the organ, all the amazing possibility, all the, uh, all the, ama- yeah, well, I don't have to explain to, to you or the listeners what's so amazing about the organ because we all know it's and I was blown away and now I, I was about I think I was um I think I was ten at the time mm-hmm. then I and from then on uh, I I was uh, uh, my father found me a very very fantastic organ teacher a uh, professor of organ at the Odense Conservatory and I continued for a very long time with him he taught me. So many things, I, I'd say. But it was my father uh, who introduced me to the instrument, and um, and uh, and that's it. And it really happened from one day to another. This interest and this fascination and love for the instrument. So people uh, usually, when they first encounter the organ, uh, sometimes they f- they fell uh, f- fall in love because. Um, 
of the grandeur, the magnificence of this instrument, <laughs> right? Uh, or the mystery. What was uh, that fascinated you about the organ for you personally? Well, uh, now, of course, uh, I can tell you what generally fascinates me about the instrument. But if I'm trying to think back on what was the initial fascination, mm -hmm. um, I would say it was the... Uh, uh, it was certainly not uh, the grandeur of the instrument. Of course, the instrument is, of course, an instrument of grandeur. But I had listened to organ music all my life. And uh, so I was very well aware of the grandeur. It was, for me, was that that was just <laughs> normal. <laughs> uh, and there was no, and it was not the mystery. It was neither the grandeur, which is, of course, there, of the instrument, nor the mystery, because the instrument itself, the grandeur, was something I was used to being, uh, being hearing organ music from when I was literally inside my mother's <laughs> belly, and uh, and the mystery actually was not that much of a mystery because I, I have been accompanying my father to church uh, for years, and so it was actually hearing organ music was very normal. But what really took me and, and, and made me completely f fall in love was that, uh, that you could bring, that I could bring this amazing instrument to life. Mm -hmm. I could bring it to life. I could, I could make uh, this giant machine into a living, a living presence, if, if, if you like. I could bring, it, it was, it was, um, I, I, I would try not to use the an, an analogy with the <laughs> Frankenstein and, uh, and his monster because uh, of the organ's unfortunate association with those horror monster movies and Frankenstein and that. But it truly is amazing that I could bring this alive and it could I could do so many things. Uh, but it has its own soul. It's not like it's not like a synthesizer or a sample player or things like that. Uh, which you can also make tons of sounds, even more than you can on an organ. But this is a real breathing instrument that you actually, it feels like you actually, it actually lives. It's actually living. And I thought, I, I think that was something I discovered there. And from then on, I was, um, I was uh, smitten with the instrument. You know, it, it makes sense, Frederick, because uh, uh, for in many cases, organ was like a, a human being, right? And and even there is a vox humana stop, right? Yes. And each each pipe, it's like a different person uh, singing in a choir, right? And if you listen to old antique organs uh, uh, of that particular vox humana stop, and I'm sure you have plenty of them in 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 Denmark. Uh, you can discover uh, different vowels or consonants like uh, a, u, e, i, o, if they're uh, if they're it's original. Mm -hmm. And the way the different Rico voices, the way the the shape of the um, of the of the pipe is actually like uh, the uh, uh, cavity of the mouth and then the throat and the whole thing. So it's really it's it's truly is it's true the Vakshamana and the, and the uh, also, the other like Apfel and 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 the, in, in that in the same family, it truly is uh, interesting uh, to hear it in um, in a, in a, in context of a human voice. I had an interesting experience uh, uh, here when I um, uh, heard a French ensemble. I think they are called Ensemble Organum, and uh, their take on uh, uh, Guillaume de Machaut's Messe de Notre Dame. And what they do is that they do not sing it in this very, very pure and and but they play sing it in, with very open voices and guttural. Mm -hmm. And certainly, when I heard that, and when I hear singing in that way, in that in that more primitive form, if if you like, then certainly the vox humana stuff on the organ makes so much more sense and it totally sense because suddenly you are aware of just how much it truly is a vox humana uh, sound. When you mentioned, Frederick, um, um, uh, uh, got um, uh, open voice, op open sound and uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, medieval uh, polyphony, I thought about uh, 
Ensemble Organum and Marcel Perez, right? Uh, right away. Yeah. I didn't hear the name right away when you were talking, but uh, I think I, I understood you <laughs> without words. <laughs> exactly. Uh -huh. And they sing Gregorian chant this way too. They do, they do mm -hmm. that. They do that. Mm -hmm. I have this recording uh, with the Mist de Notre Dame, Guillaume de Machus, Mist de Notre Dame, and it's so interesting. There are many, many layers. We could discuss them for, for an, an early Gregorian chant for, for hours, but, but in this case, as it, as it pertains for the, uh, relates to the, uh, to the organ, it's, it's very interesting because the instrument is really so much alive and you really have to think of it as, as being alive. That, that's how I feel about organ playing. You really have a responsibility to bring it to life and think of it as a singing voice, some of it and some of other in instrument, but always, always make music, always make music and, 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 and bring it alive. That's, uh, that's, um, that's, I think that has been my mantra uh, all the way through my, my organ career and, and, and that was the very initial, sometimes the first reaction is, is, is with you all, always. Mm -hmm. And so that was uh, that was my my beginning, and of course, uh, not to not all of the people think this way, right? If we remember Igor Stravinsky, who said the monster never breathes, right? Yes, but he had a very bad experience with an organ because, as as uh, you probably know, he made this uh, mass. I think I can't remember the the title of the work. Uh, where there is actually an, a part for the organ, the only time he ever wrote something for organ, and it was performed in in an Italian cathedral. I can't remember where, or certainly not by whom. But I can imagine that what I can imagine that he did not give the instrument a proper chance. Mm -hmm. I would say that he probably it probably did not work as he intended. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe the organist is at fault. Maybe the instrument was not capable enough, and maybe he himself did not put enough into the organ. I have tons of respect for Stravinsky, one of the uttermost great composers, but he is dead wrong about that. Yeah. And of course, he was composing in a time when organ playing was just completely legato, right? Uh, this was um, sort of mid-20th uh, mid, um, century tradition or even earlier. Yes. And uh, maybe there, because of that, he couldn't understand uh, how, how alive the organ can be. It is certainly because it, if everything is just legato all the time, mm -hmm. <laughs> everything then suddenly I can understand why you would think it does not breathe. Mm -hmm. But actually, in this case, it is, and I remain, and, and this actually leads me back to the thing, it is the organist's responsibility to make it live mm -hmm. and breathe. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the thing of it is the, the melodic lines should be thought in a cantabular way, always, I think, that it should sing, but you cannot sing without air, and you need, so you need to, to actually... Uh, I, I wouldn't say emulate, but you need to create uh, uh, the, that articulation. But if everything is played legato, I, I'm sure he's right. Then it cannot, it can sound as if it doesn't read. You're right. <laughs> and uh, today, of course, there are uh, like um, there have been 50 or more years passed since Stravinsky uh, uh, right uh, composing times and uh, everybody probably knows how to articulate well but probably mm -hmm. still older generation of organists uh, have been st stubborn right have you noticed yourself uh, those legato and completely um, uh, without uh, uh, without breathing uh, performances yourself uh, today uh, uh, well, rarely. Today, I would say, as uh, today, uh, you hear it's very rarely heard. Mm -hmm. Today, I would say, actually, the only time I would say I I probably encounter it if if uh, I'm at a service or something, and and the organist is inexperienced mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, today. But I I assume yes that you're right that uh, that was not a sign of inexperience but it was a, a matter of of, of taste mm -hmm. and um, and well 
it was a matter of taste, but I would say today, uh, luckily, we have a different taste. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Luckily, we have a different taste. We, when I say we, I think I, I probably I doesn't we does not talk for everyone, but probably a majority of of organists today would not play everything legato. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you have to play. You have nothing must be legato, of course, but it must just it must live. It must be natural in a way. It must be natural. How different is this legato uh, perceived uh, when you are on the organ bench and when you are out uh, in the pews, in the, in the nave? Uh, do you think that when the treatises say that it has to be sort of a little bit uh, uh, more connected, do they mean that it's more legato when you play it or it's more legato when you listen to it downstairs? I think uh, in just from the scientific uh, uh, method, when you play, you are very close to the instrument, and you have, uh, depending, of course, where you sit, but most of the time you would be very close to the instrument. And uh, if you, ha you are in a church with a, a, a rather large uh, acoustic settings, uh, you may not you may not think you play legato, uh, but in the nave it may sound legato because. You, when you are right next to the pipes, right next to the divisions, organ divisions, you you get a much closer feeling, of course. So I would say uh, this would, of course, be that. So so theoretically, it should be that uh, it is, feels more legato outside in the church. Mm -hmm. I think that should that might be the logical uh, uh, solution or answer to that. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it would depend on where the. Uh, if it's an, an instrument with electric uh, and the and the console is placed in a distance from the rest of the in, from the instrument itself, uh, then it could be different because mm -hmm. it would be different. Also, some some maybe you are there could be different acoustic. But in as a rule of thumb, a general rule, I think, and you should actually and it's important. And this is one of the things that uh, organists also have to in particular have to uh, have to understand that you're playing with the room the room is also a part of your instrument mm -hmm. you cannot you cannot you cannot uh, uh, neglect you cannot consider the room you cannot play the same way in different rooms it's mm -hmm. just not going to work not well at least of course, you're now a very experienced and capable organist and composer, so you know all these intricate details, how to play with the utmost uh, uh, um, detail, right, and, and, and uh, clarity. Uh, but when you first started, do you, do you remember the times when you still uh, uh, struggled with, with the concept of articulation and adjustment with, uh, with different instruments? <laughs> Yes, and uh, I would say that uh, one of my strengths has always been uh, my approach to the... Uh, I have always been... And I think from the early start, but of course there was... In the beginning, it, it, I struggled. It, it, everyone struggles. It is a struggle. I still struggle sometimes with, uh, with some things, but I've always been very goal-oriented uh, with my playing. And, and, and very... It's, it's, it's the result that counts. And I've always been... I want to achieve that goal, so I, I wanted to achieve. So I started early on actually playing pieces that were probably more difficult than than. But I had uh, than my level was at the time. But I had this great teacher I mentioned, Ibintl, who actually allowed me and encouraged me to to play difficult pieces at a young at a young age and learn. But it was also very strict. So uh, I think it was there was much struggle. It's, it's, it is a struggle to learn. If you think it's easy to learn something, if you think it will be a pleasure all the time, mm -hmm. then you should probably do something else, I think, right? It's, uh, there is a struggle. And I certainly had a struggle also. Uh, but I think one of the things is that um, I had also, I, I listened a lot. I, and I was very interested in the instruments from an, from, from when I was 10 and began my interest in the organ, in the music, at the same time I also started, began an interest in the instruments. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, when I was 12, 13, 
I was uh, my my parents I, on my request, and 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 they were, this was the best thing I could. When other people went to theme parks and and that, I just wanted to go on organ tours and visit instruments all over and organ crawls and get in the instruments. So we took they took a tour around me, and I heard many different organs. And I sometimes the organs would be there also and play. So I heard it both play them myself, but I also heard them outside. Mm-hmm. So, and I think there's really a lot to be said for learning by by doing different things and and experiencing a lot of different things. I think it's important for organists to hear a lot of different instruments, if possible, if they have access to to to, to visit. At you should when you're learning, it, and it's just as important, if not even more, when you're in the learning process. I would think that go and call all organs in your local community and general area and visit these organs and hear them from the nave and play them yourself because by experiencing so many instruments I think and so many rooms I think in the end certainly there is something it is you 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 just it gets to be natural to adapt to to the different instruments mm-hmm. because you you play so many different organs and so I went on organ tours and tried organ after organ after organ. I made a little notebook where I uh, wrote down co- notes and comments and registrations of all these organs. I think I, I think I visited when I just when I was twelve thirty. I think I visited something like fifty organs in Denmark alone. Mm-hmm. It, it was really, really useful for me to get. Also, because in the end, you you get to enjoy the uh, plurality, the difference of these instruments. I I'm so glad you mentioned this, Frederick, because um, when I whenever I think about uh, getting experience on many instruments, many different instruments, uh, kind of a, a comparison with the car uh, comes to mind. Whenever you you take your car to a mechanic, right, uh, and uh, he or she will drive it uh, backwards, for example. Without even looking, without uh, without a s- second of of delay or hesitation, because uh, uh, through his hands and feet, um, hundreds or even thousands cars right uh, pass yes. right, and and he is a professional at this right. So uh, I think uh, you you made a great point here, uh, inviting people to contact local organists and get out and and uh, and see if 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 they can play the organs themselves. Especially if they're traveling to a different country, now Actually. it's so different. Not so it's so easy to contact and get to know other instrument uh, instrumentalists and organists from another continent, even right, and see if you get get a chance to to get on the organ bench in Spain, in France, in Denmark, yes. or in Germany, or in Lithuania, or in America, or in Australia, anywhere, right? Whenever you travel uh, for personal for personal reasons, right? Y- yes, y- y- people should be. Uh, I think I think all organists should do that, and they should not only do that when they are experienced. Because I think very few organists would reject a young uh, learning organist the chance to to come and just play, but just doesn't have to be for hours. It could be just for ten minutes or thirty minutes or an hour or whatever you you get, but. I think it should be a part of the. I think it should be a part of the education. Uh, you should consider it an education. I think people should consider it an education. Trying as many of them. I think I love your analog, analogy with the uh, with the uh, uh, car mechanics, and it's so spot on. They can drive any car right away because they they have tried, and then they don't have any fear or or. And I think that is uh, uh, that's one of the common things. I hear from people when I when I talk sometimes with other organists and we talk about different instruments and then and then say and suddenly say, oh, and you were not afraid of playing on that big instrument, for example, if I've been to large instruments. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's so strange. Afraid? How could you be afraid of playing an organ? Afraid is like completely. But if you have not played as m- many many organs, I can totally understand. That that can it can be fearful if it's something new. So 
break down the fear and remove the fear, visit, learn the other instruments, try as many different, both in, and also in many different styles. It's very important, I think, that people try and, and experience also baroque organs, and there are, uh, um, and it doesn't only have to be the uh, authentic, true, few existing existing instruments. It can be modern re, re, uh, restorations or reconstructions as well, and romantic instruments and uh, more contemporary uh, multi uh, universal instruments, if you like. Mm -hmm. It should be a broad pattern. I think uh, to the young organ student, I would say try as many organs and just lose the fear, mm -hmm. and that will be the best uh, medicine against fear. Mm -hmm. And fear is is something that I think is one of the th essential things we should try to eradicate or at least minimize. You should never be afraid, but it can be if 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 yeah. But one other thing is that uh, the goal should be to, one of the goals as an organist should be not to be afraid of the instrument, mm -hmm. not to be afraid, not to be afraid of, of trying sometimes radical things. Mm -hmm. now, I'm, not I'm, not all, I'm not talking radical things, it can be in, in the small details in the way you articulate, in the way you try a different registration, but try and, and not, not be afraid of trying. I think that's important. And of course, when people are afraid, they freeze and panic sometimes, right? Yes. And one, yes. Of, one of the uh, great uh, tricks uh, against that is probably instead of jumping uh, and leaping uh, down the dark pool at night and not knowing where do you land, right? Like like trying one American maker organ with all these uh, one uh, more than 100 stops and uh, and uh, playing intricate uh, uh, romantic organ uh, repertoire with lots and lots of registration changes, which is intimidating right away. You could... Uh, you could uh, step by step wade into into this big instrument and play a few stops at a time and uh, w instead of changing all the time you could play on one manual only add a little mm. bit you know like a very gradual adjustment ma to make uh, absolutely and in, in uh, one of the things i think you should always do when you try a new organ is start by it, it's of course it's, this is uh, of, we are these are just our opinions, of course, but I think we have some, a, certain, uh, a certain experience to back up these opinions. And one of the things, I think, is start by trying just a few stops. Listen, how is the principle in the, in the great organ? There's, there's, they can be so different, and they often tell a lot about the instrument. Try the different flutes. Try the, don't start by just pulling everything out and just, it tells you, very little. It tells almost nothing. The, the full organ uh, sound is very, very uh, ininformative. Get to use, know the details. Get to know the details. And, and true, start by just playing in one moment, just start, and then build up gradually to the big to the to the big uh, <laughs> confrontation, if you like. <laughs> Which is exactly the opposite Johann Sebastian Bach did when he encountered a new instrument. Oh, Remember, yes, he, he but, Pulled, yeah. But he put, but he did that to test its lungs. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, he, that was, so there was no. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. He had a different purpose, right? That's it had a different purpose, mm -hmm. and and you, uh, I would say, on most modern organs and most existing organs that are alive today, uh, you do not have to do that because uh, uh, luckily those times of. Uh, what's it called? Ciphers and 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 and, and uh, I, I know it in Danish. I can't remember the English, but when there is um, leaks of air, yeah, cipher, cipher, mm -hmm. ciphers, yeah. Mm -hmm. These they and and lack of uh, they are not that common. Mm -hmm. They are not that common. I don't know. I actually maybe that's because I'm, I'm talking. Maybe they are still common, but uh, I don't know really if it helps anything because to know <laughs> to know how bad they are. <laughs> But uh, Bach was also an organ consultant, mm -hmm. uh, not to forget. Uh, so he was very deeply uh, involved in the, uh, also in the construction. I've never played the organ in Naumburg, in the St. Wenzel, uh, um, uh, the Hildebrand organ, in, uh, but I have listened to recordings of it and, uh, and, and seen the stop list and everything. It's very fascinating to, to actually see what, what, what was Bach's 
you have Sebastian Bach's own preferences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very useful. Yeah, very useful and interesting to see how it's in a in a in a in a different. It's not like in the early Baroque. It's 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 like he 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 has that melting point between some trans tra, uh, what you call transient uh, uh, organ style mm -hmm. pointing uh, into the future. From, right, right. And he was very forward-looking man, right? Uh, very <coughs> fut futuristic in his harmonic ideas, in his fingering ideas, in his uh, compositional ideas, everything, right? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And it's amazing how a composer like Bach can remain so relevant today. Mm -hmm. He's as relevant today as he was when he was alive. Mm -hmm. And of course, he uh, he had all those ancient ideas, uh, which he integrated into his uh, style and uh, mindset. But then, somehow, blended with new ideas and uh, produced something very high and majestic. Yes, and the in interesting thing is that sometimes, uh, sometimes all the progress, the real progress, it actually is uh, not necessarily scraping everything old and, and trying to invent the wheel again from scratch. It's built on ancient ideas which are then transformed and, and, and utilized in new ways. And that was exactly, as you say, also a built on ancient idea, what, what he did. Uh, and I think uh, the pursuit of originality is a dangerous one because you, you cannot decide to be original. <laughs> it is something that must come. It's 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 a product actually. Mm. It's not it's not a goal in itself. And of course uh, as a composer you perfectly know this, right? Uh, everyone know everyone know uh, wants to be original somehow because oh. everything was created beforehand and mm. we don't want to create something old sounded and uh, old fashioned, right? We want to be And when I was a young composer, younger composer, I tried I thought, "Oh, I must be original mm -hmm. too." And I, I had that feeling and and experience has taught me that it's completely wrong way to think of it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you should just not consider it, but it must not be a main goal in itself to be original because it's something it's something you, you can't just decide it. And you, you it's much better to just take what you know and then look at it at different angles and maybe, just maybe, you look at it in an original angle and take it in a new way. But it, you always build on something that is existing. Of course, in the 60s and 50s and 60s, you have tried everything. Mm -hmm. you have tried, everything has been done by now, almost. Mm -hmm. So there is... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, one of the easiest ways to be original is to take something old, two pieces of old and mix them together in a new and original way that hasn't exactly. been done before and that's it exactly that's it and, and that's it it's very simple actually yeah yeah <laughs> two or three ideas which which are rarely put together right mm -hmm. um, but but it could be done even today even today so let's talk uh, uh, frederick about uh, your compositions because uh, they are very uh, ethereal and mysterious at times how did you start to compose for the organ and other instruments well uh, the organ i started uh, to compose for uh, in, in that in that way i i i, I told in in the beginning uh, that uh, i had composed for the piano up until then, and I have composed a lot of songs, also hymns. Uh, I had been a very much, it was very much the human voice that, that started my journey, mm -hmm. combined with the piano. I loved to improvise when I was very uh, early, uh, from an early age, and, very, and, and uh, the, my talent came in that I was actually able to not just bang the, in the piano, I was able to, to put together music and to put it together and create a structure and a form mm -hmm. um, but um, the mysterious uh, the mysterious qualities I I think I'm not act, I'm not actively uh, very rarely at least actively pursuing mystery mm -hmm. 
but I think that uh, I am in. I am when I when I compose. Um, I have this uh, sense of still I, of of wonderment. I can still be amazed by by, by many things. And I can um, and that doesn't doesn't mean that I'm easily amazed, but I can be amazed at the wonders of the music and and, and the wonders of strangeness of the world around us as well. And and things I don't think the music can exist completely isolated from the. Um, from the exterior world, from your own life, I think you can you can have uh, a, a very different kind of life than your have your music, but it's but it, the music is of course part of you. It's 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 part. So I I think I'm it's it's uh, it just ends out that way because there are many mysterious things still, even though we live in an age uh, where. Most things can be explained scientifically, and most things can be put on a uh, spreadsheet and 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 set in, in in very specific orders. There, are, luckily, there are still wonders of of the world. Some of them good, some of them not so good. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard for me to explain exactly how, why my music has, as you say, mysterious or qualities, because that would be kind of that's kind of part of the mystery, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I do think that I sometimes uh, retain a certain childlike enthusiasm and, and, and sense of 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 mystery, where where many things are mysterious mm-hmm. when you are a child, and uh, I think that is uh, uh, hopefully hopefully I hope. It means that I retain that childlike amazement, and doesn't mean that it becomes infantile, <laughs> because there are two different, very different concepts: uh, the infantile and the childlike. The childlike can be a real quality. The infantile is, of course, just uh, yeah. mm-hmm. yeah. and no. so. So, as human beings, we should probably seek a childlike quality, right? To be curious always about the world about the music this curiosity probably drives you as a composer don't you think yes yes i, I don't think we should seek a childlike world uh, but i think if we could see the world sometimes uh, a little uh, more childlike and, and 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 be a little less on guard and a little less biased and, and with and with preconceived notions uh, and I think that goes not only in music. I think that actually goes. Uh, I think uh, trying to like understand things that you are uh, politically or socially or culturally uh, profilerated to to think that the world is in this way and this is right and wrong. There are of course some universal rights and wrongs, but sometimes it's. Um, I think it's very useful. I, I, I think we need, as a human race, to be more, uh, to be more, uh, yeah, to, to be more childlike in that way. To be a little less pre, prejudged, prejudged, uh, judging, uh, a little less, less judgmental. And I think that's perhaps. Uh, um, I think I, 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 my music do retain some of that because I retain that as a person. And sometimes it could be, and uh, probably I've been from time to time criticized for that as well, because it does make it does seem that I I, I am not afraid of uh, breaking out of uh, of stylistic borders and and, and using everything uh, sometimes completely. Uh, where you think, oh, you cannot put these things together. You you have to to make it that way. And I sometimes do it a little different. Mm-hmm. In um, and that can be that can be a challenge sometimes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, because of these uh, uh, preconceived associations, right? People have. Yes. If you put together classical and pop ideas, for example, you have a mix, but sort of a, a dirty mix, and uh, the composer seems like a selling out, right? Yes, but but I think it's important thing to uh, to remember here that uh, that it's there. I think there is actually. Uh, 
it, you can mix things, and sometimes it goes wrong. I wouldn't say I have. I I think I've luckily avoided it. Uh, but sometimes when you put classical and rock music, for example, together, it it creates some horrible results. It it, it there are many many examples of that. Uh, and especially when you blend classical and pop music, it can be terrible. It can be very, um, it can be kind of cheap and, and plastic-like. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean, and this is the central thing, it doesn't mean that it cannot be done in interesting, artistic, and yet still uh, 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 lis listenable ways. Um so I think it's 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 about not being afraid of trying to do it. And I have I have uh, I've done a lot of collaborations on uh, even with extreme uh, uh, ex ex extremities. Uh, I've, uh, uh, if you 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 probably read on my uh, bio view, I even worked with a hip hop group and uh, and created where I I composed. Uh, 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 sections for orchestra, purely orchestral sections, and also for organ, uh, and it was integrated with their hip hop uh, tracks, and it actually worked. It actually worked, and that's the amazing thing. You know, this crossover music sometimes is cheap and cliche, but sometimes yes, it can cliche. open new new vistas, right? And uh, I remember uh, some some rock. Uh, folk rock uh, group, as, as ethnic uh, uh, rock group in Lithuania asking me to collaborate with them uh, in one of them uh, their upcoming concerts in my church, Vilnius mm -hmm. University St. John's Church, and uh, uh, they said, oh, I know you, you are an improviser. Could you improvise uh, while we c create our mystery, musical mystery based on... Uh, on uh, all all saints' uh, story, you know, biblical story and other, you know, very typical uh, story, f typical for November's first uh, festivity in the Catholic Church. So, I at first I said, oh, rock and organ, maybe it will be uh, too much, a little bit uh, for me, but in order to stay um, relevant and curious all the time you you, you seek those new ideas and uh, edges uh, where you when you can expand your boundaries right and Absolutely. think think what is possible and what are the limits of your 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 imagination and i said yes so uh, we are going to do this and uh, i'm not not sure how it's going to be but at least it's gonna be great experience, and, it, and, and it sounds great. And I think that is uh, that, that you do that, and and are still open. You should never reject anything. That doesn't mean you should accept anything. You should have a very high level in, with whatever you do and whatever we do. We should always try to ex aspire to the highest level mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of excellence. Truly, and it doesn't matter if it's just playing for the smallest service where there are ten people. In the congregation, or playing huge concerts, so all we should always aspire, and uh, but always remain open. And I think it's wonderful that you you accept it, and it's going to be very interesting. I will look forward to hear if it's recorded the uh, the result of that. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm not sure uh, uh, what the style will be because. Uh, of course, I can accommodate their style as well. Uh, we will have to fit together, uh, work together, yes. right? Because Pinkavich's style is different from that group style. But together, yes. we'll you should not try to, to you should not try to alter your style to mm. suit them. Yeah, they sh the, the the goal. I think that my experience tells me that th this works only when the two different styles, or three, or how many there are respect each other. Mm -hmm. If the group respect your style and you respect the group style, then you can make magic together. The, the easiest way of explaining this to people is to think of music making as a communication as basically conversation right we're making us creating a story a musical story together uh, whether on one on one or one organist alone or two people on on the same organ bench or five people in a band in a group uh, or an entire orchestra with choir for example we still create a story and communicate don't you think that would be an uh, a more productive way of looking at, at things i think it's a very good i think it's a very good way because music is, of course, communication. Mm -hmm. that, is, uh, that is the whole thing of 
of performing and playing music instead of just having it inside your head. As, as every time you play something, regardless, or sing, every time you perform music, you are communicating. And of course, when you perform with others, then you are communicating with these persons. It's, I think it's a, a perfect way to explain it. I think it's a very good way to explain it. Absolutely, I agree. So, Frederick, uh, do you encourage people to compose, organists to compose, or, or it's just an elite group of people who are brave enough to start, or is it a, a universal, democratic uh, uh, self-expression tool? Well, <clears throat> that's actually a big question. Mm -hmm. That's actually a big question. Uh, because, in a way, I am probably a little... And it sounds terrible. I'm probably a little, tiny bit elitist. I don't think everyone should necessarily compose. But I think people should certainly not be discouraged from composing. Uh, and then, but then must accept that perhaps the compositions will just remain by them, for themselves or the, the, mm -hmm. the closest relatives. I think, but, but you could never, at least when it comes to children, and young pe young persons, you should not discourage it because how could you know if someone can compose or not if they never try it? <laughs> so, I should I say certainly try it mm -hmm. and don't don't hesitate and and and, and I will and if if if, if young persons uh, children young persons come to me and ask for I will give it the best I can and I will never say oh no don't compose. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that they will become composers or that their compositions will will end up having that those qualities that that makes them staying and makes them come out in the uh, in the world in, in one way or another. I think in the end, um, sometimes perhaps organists have uh, there is even a, a too much pressure for for some organists on on composing because I can respect an organist. Not every organist needs to compose. Mm -hmm. I think every organist, of course, also uh, for use with the service and needs to be able to do some some different modulations and and thing and and and, and, and but not every organist needs to be a composer. Uh, and um, I think that's uh, uh, that's. Thing. I would never discourage anything from starting on composing, mm -hmm. but I don't think there is room. I don't think it's a. Uh, I don't think necessarily composing needs to be for everyone. It, right. it, I, I, in that regard, I am slightly elitist, if you if if you like. <laughs> The way a person can find out whether he or she is um, called to compose is, is, is this inner drive, right? Curiosity mm. to, to try out new things. And if, if, uh, if a person feels this curiosity about that uh, activity of composition, right? Or, or improvisation, too. Improvisation. Then why not? Why don't... Uh, why to say to, to a person, no, no, you, you, you cannot. You are not talented enough, right? Because... As you say, how he or she will find out if if we never try, right? No, no, they should definitely try, and I don't think anyone should be discouraged from from setting out on the journey. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, that doesn't mean that everyone will become a composer. Right, right, because it takes a lot and lot of work. Uh, because your first Very compositions, when you look at, at the beginning, Frederick, probably yes. not not as great as today, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, certainly not. Actually, some of them have some very good ideas mm -hmm. uh, in them, which uh, which I think when I look back at them, say, oh, that was actually good. But the, um, shall we say, the execution mm -hmm. <laughs> is not. <laughs> and that is where in the real work lies. Mm -hmm. The ideas, I think, if you have the talent, the ideas will come to you. Mm -hmm. But actually taking ideas and making real music, real compositions, real works out of them. That is the hard work. And sometimes it can be hard and it can be it can be very uh, frustrating. It can be extremely frustrating. I've become physically ill at some point uh, uh, where I when I was 
uh, it ended with uh, me being admitted to a hospital because I had been working on one composition for uh, more than a year and I had not made progress and I was I had scraped complete I scraped uh, 15 minutes of co almost completed symphonic music and I just completely destroyed it and obliterated it and it was terrible and I was I became ill mm. physically ill so exactly. composing can be it's certainly not one of the things that can annoy me, but I understand how you can, some people can think it. Sometimes people think, oh, but making music is like a hobby, and it, it must be the dream life to, to live of doing your hobby. But it's not a hobby unless your hobby jumps up in the face and bites you. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's sometimes the music really fights back. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a fight. It's like for some novelists, right? They they sit and write every day. They struggle. They are in desperate mu mood, but they still uh, sit down and write no matter what for one year, right? And suddenly yes. they are uh, they discard their all ideas and start anew, right? And it takes ten drafts some sometimes to complete a no good novel for for some people, right? And uh, and and still they they go from failure to failure. And still going through it to success somehow, right? Yes, to have this yes. positive attitude at all times. Do you think this is important? Yes. Um, uh, I'm. I'm not necessarily. Uh, uh, y y absolutely, you need that positive uh, attitude. You need that drive. I'm not. Uh, uh, I don't subscribe to the theory that you have to think positive and you cannot think negatively because I, I don't think it works. But I think you really need to. You you need to accept that failure in 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 some one way or another is a part of it, mm -hmm. and so composing and 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 seek, seek, uh, seeking a life as a composer and, and 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 by that also as a musician as a performing musician as well, as well, you will need as a performing musician you will you will experience failure in the sense that you want to perform something and you can it won't work and then you will work harder and you will practice more and you will work harder and you will know when to stop practicing also and take a step back <laughs> and you will learn all the things and certainly you will be able to play it and 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 things will open up and as a composer you will fail and you will put music out and sometimes it will work and sometimes there will be things and you will have to scrape and start over it's a it's a very long so it's certainly so yes when you ask if i encourage people to start i, I encourage them to try mm -hmm. but um but only those with the real passion and drive mm -hmm. and a certain glutton for punishment <laughs> uh, and a certain tolerance of uh, <laughs> of, of pain <laughs> will actually prevail right right so fantastic ideas uh, Frederick in this conversation and uh, before we end uh, um, let me ask you this question which which is kind of interesting uh, uh, what is the one thing you wish you knew when you first started to your organ journey that might have helped you yes that's a very good question that's a very good question I think one of the things I would have liked to do this is uh, can be easily misunderstood I did not uh, think I produced anything of inferior quality of, of unjust but when I felt the success uh, coming early on, it made me a little too, um, I think I became too, I wouldn't say content, but, uh, but I wish that I would at periods when I was, when I was in my early 20s, late teens, early 20s especially, I wish I had not slacked and I wish I had kept discipline mm -hmm. I wish I had kept this and I wish that I had not taken things necessarily for granted because do not take things for granted do not take your playing for granted continue continue to excel continue to aspire for a higher uh, standard and do it any time you play and does, does not whether you play for two people or for two thousand people mm -hmm. and whether it's do your uttermost 
And I would wish I could go back, uh, and not because of slack, but I think that I could have, in some ways, uh, avoided long periods where I was had problems composing if I had if I had not relaxed uh, and if I had continued to aspire for for better and for better and for better. I ca- and then later on I caught I caught on to that again and that's my complete mantra every time every time I play do my utmost and it doesn't matter who who is listening or not. Uh, but I think that would be uh, I, th- I think never never to relax and never to well you can relax as a person and you can and, and, and you need to physically relax but never relax your in that way never never give up on trying to improve always always never be content mm-hmm. and I wish I could explain the young me just how important that is just how important that is and just how important the gift of playing and, and, and just how it is a responsibility, mm-hmm. and uh, it it could be translated in another, in another, and put it in another way. Feel the thirst of perfection. Right? Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Thirst yes. or hunger, yeah. hunger. Feel the hunger for perfection, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and 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 um, and of course, don't. It could be misunderstood because it wasn't that I just slacked and just didn't give, but I could in those years. I think I could have felt it hard, more, and I wish I could go back and feel that more and use that and, and, and get even more out of my 20s because, um, but luckily as a, at least as a composer and a, a performing and it, if you're not in, in, if you're in what we call classical music world, there is not the same ageism as there is in, in, in pop music and rock music world. Uh, so uh, we can remedy our mistakes, mm-hmm. but uh, but that doesn't mean that we should slack. Yes, I think you said it very well. Feel the thirst of perfection. And this is your number one advance uh, advice for the people, right? Uh, who, I think it would be. I think right. it would be. At least it would be to myself as a as a as a, as a young. Uh, and there will because there will come a time, one way or another, where that feeling will be challenged. I think, I think it's natural. And that's where you should keep it and, and preserve it mm-hmm. and fight through. Because then that is the hard work. That is the hard work. Fair enough, Frederick. So tell us, uh, how can people find you online and your work? Uh, maybe give us a link to your website or something? Yes, mm-hmm. certainly. Uh, my website is www.magle, like my last name, Maule. M-A-G-L-E dot D-K or dot com. Actually, I, I, I have that. And you can also search for Frederick Maule on Facebook and on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel where I uh, regularly post um, uh, excerpts and sometimes full works. Uh, and I have a Facebook page. It's simply Facebook dot com slash Frederick Maule, like my name, F-R-E-D-E-R-I-K M-A-G-L-E <laughs> if I could spell my own name <laughs> luckily I can play uh, but uh, there are plenty of ways but my, my own personal website probably a very good place to start because there are also links to from the front page the links both to my Facebook page and to YouTube channel Thank you so much, Frederick. You have a tremendous... Thank you. It has been a great pleasure talking with you. Fantastic conversation. And uh, hopefully this year will will create so many great uh, endeavors for you. And you, you will continue to be brave in exploring them and industrious enough into making them into completion and yeah. seek that uh, first of perfection that you're talking Indeed. about. Indeed, seeking the perfection. And likewise, I hope every endeavor for you will go brilliantly and we will seek the thirst of perfection, both of us. I know we will. I know we will. It was, uh, it was a great pleasure talking with you. Thank you. If you liked this conversation, I encourage you to visit my blog, Secrets of Organ Playing, at organduo.lt where you will find lots of insights, practical advice, and training for every area of organ playing. 
You can subscribe to this blog for free to get your daily dose of inspiration and to be the first to know when any of my future podcasts roll out. I hope to help you reach your dreams in organ playing. I'm Vida Spinkavitus. Thanks for listening and I'll catch you online really soon.